Okay, well, we're ready to start class. We'll kick off the reading quiz. First question being, plastic deformation, A, causes bonds to rupture, B, corresponds to the motion of dislocations, C, is permanent, or D, all of the above? In, by definition, plastic deformation. Okay, we're going to wrap this one up. If you're having connectivity issues, you can come find me after class. I'll make sure you get your points. Okay, we are going to end this one, though. Okay, A, B, C, or D? Definitely D. Okay, next question. A slip system includes what? A, the direction with the lowest linear atomic density, B, the plane with the lowest planar density, or C, the plane with the highest planar density. Okay, answers in. Wrap this one up. Okay, definitely see the highest planar density. Another, if we could have had another answer, it could have been in the highest linear density direction, right? So the most packed plane. And the reason why that happens is because that's what corresponds to the least amount of atoms uh, distortion, right? So for example, in this group of class, if these are all atoms, if I, could, if I could choose to slide atoms past one another, by far the easiest way would be to slide this row over, right? Or I could, I alternately I could say I could slide it this way, right? If I go at some off angle at a lower linear density direction, it's going to correspond to more atoms having to scooch out of the way during that. So if you do it on the highest, dense, high, most, act, most densely packed plane in the most densely packed direction, you just minimize strain during deformation. Okay, the last reading quiz question is, Single crystals deform or yield A, when phi and lambda both equal 90 degrees B, when the resolved shear stress reaches the critical shear stress C, when the critical shear stress reaches a maximum or D, when phi and lambda are not equal Okay, answers in. We'll wrap this one up in a minute. Okay, we're going to end it. A, B, C, or D. People think. Okay, definitely answers B. We're gonna do an example of this one right now. Okay, so we left off last time. We'd been describing deformation of single crystals 
as sort of like the simplest scenario to examine, because you don't have to worry about grain boundaries or different orientations. The whole thing has one orientation that you have to deal with. And we basically said that even though you apply what you think is just tension, right? You pull on this thing and you think you're just applying tension. You don't think you're applying shear. On some arbitrary plane and in some arbitrary direction within that plane, there is what's called a resolved shear stress, right? Even though you're applying uh, stress normal to this plane, this plane is now tilted. So there is a component of that stress that you apply, which is now shear. It's causing atoms to slide past one another, right? We can use that then to calculate um, slip in these single crystal systems. So here's our first clicker question for the day. It says, determine the tensile stress that is applied along the 110 axis of a silver crystal to cause slip on the 111 plane in the 011 direction system. The critical resolved shear stress for this crystal is six megapascals. So again, if we were gonna draw this, we'd draw something like this. We'd say, this is our single crystal. We're applying a tensile loading like that. And the direction of the tensile load is the 110 direction, right? So you square brackets, 110 direction. And then somewhere in this thing, we've got a, a slip system, which is the 111 plane. And then in the direction of 011, we see slip occurring, right? There's this direction that's normal to the, to the slip plane, right? And because it's the 111 plane, the normal to it is the 111 direction with square bars, right? Square brackets. So the last thing we need to draw here is this angle from here to here, that is phi, and this angle from here to there is lambda. And then we recall that the, let's see, the, result, the, the resolved shear stress tau equals the applied stress multiplied by the cosine of phi multiplied by the cosine of lambda. So one last thing I guess to recall is that if you have two angles, two vectors, excuse me, vector A and you have vector B and you want to figure out the angle between those, that the cosine of that angle is equal to the dot product of the two vectors, A dot B, divided by the length of those two vectors, length of A, length of B. Okay, so give a shot at solving what would be the critical resolved shear stress for this compound, given that information. If you got questions, we have a, at least one TA here today. And remember, since this formula only asks for the cosine of those angles, don't solve for the exact angle. You just need the cosine of the angle, right? So save yourself some steps. And when you're ready, you're going to give your answer with one decimal place.
Okay, just another minute on this one. Okay, I'm going to wrap this one up. If you're getting close, phone a friend maybe. We're going to end this one soon. Again, you're solving for tau. You don't need to work out the actual angle. You just need cosine of the angles. Okay, I'm going to end. Okay, I think the answer, oh, I need to fix my solution, that's, that's incorrect. It should be less than six for sure. All right, I'll go back and fix my solution. I can make it so whatever you answer you gave will still give you credit. My solution's wrong here. It should be around 2.4. Um, looks like most people are getting that, 2.5. Most of those answers are correct. Something's wrong with this 14.7. I'll figure that out so it went wrong. Well, let's work it out together. How about that? Let's work this thing out together. So on this one, okay, so we're solving for tau, and you know what, what sigma is, right? So tau is going to be at least 6 megapascals, and then that's going to be multiplied by, let's do cosine of phi first. So cosine of phi, that's the direction, that's the angle between the normal plane and the loading direction. So 111 and 110, right? So we're going to take 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 0. That's our dot product for those two vectors. We're then going to divide this by 1, 1, 1. So that's 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. So square root of 3. And then this other one is just going to be square root of 2. 1 squared plus 1 squared. So this whole thing is going to be 1 over root 3 root 2. Okay? And... Two. Math. Sorry. Two over that. Okay. Any, we all agree on that much? Let's do cosine of phi now. Cosine of phi is going to be between the slip direction, the 011, and the loading direction, the 110. So start with the dot product. It's going to be 0 times 1 plus 1 times 1. Oops. Plus 0 times 1. So that's just one in the numerator there. And then in the denominator, we're going to do the length of that vector, which is square root of 2 times the square root of 2. So this is just 1 over square root of 2 times square root of 2. 
Okay? So if you plug those in, this term right here, 2 over root 3, root 2, and then this one being 1 over root 2, root 2. Let's plug that in and see, if, see what the answer is. Two point four four. Is that uh, am I doing something wrong, Logan? Question? Shouldn't tau be the resolved critical shear stress? Isn't tau by definition the resolved shear stress? Oh, we did this wrong. Okay, the critical resolved shear stress. Sorry, I, I interpret. Yeah, you're exactly right. I read that wrong when I read, did this question. Up here, we're told that the critical resolved shear stress is six megapascals, right? Mm -hmm. So six right there, six megapascals equals tau. I'll make it so any answer here was correct, since I set that up wrong for you guys. That's where the 14 comes from. If you work this thing backwards, if you solve for tau, I'm sure that's the 14.7. Let me just double check it. Is it, is it though? Yeah. All right, so it is. So when you solve for tau, I'll double check this after class, and again, make that credit for whatever you did, but 14.7 megapascals. More importantly, did the approach make sense on a question like this? It's, you do a little bit of these dot products and length of these vectors, it's not the, not the worst thing ever. What I will not do on a midterm is what I won't do is I won't give you tau and sigma and expect you to solve for one of these directions, right? Because it would be really hard. You'd have to do a whole bunch of different vector algebra and it would just chew up a lot of time. That would be fair game on a homework, although I didn't do it on this coming homework, I don't think, or the homework you're doing now. Uh, but on the midterm, I'll give you these directions and I'll have you either solve for tau or sigma. Any questions on how you'd go about doing this? Is there anything unclear that I can clarify? Okay, let's keep going then. So that was from last class. Um, a quick announcement for today, Logan's session, we're gonna start at a half an hour normal than, uh, later than normal. So normally it starts right after class, I think. Today we're gonna start that half an hour back, I have to get the TAs ready for next class. Um, and then let's talk about the, the Instron data question. One of the things it asks is it gives you a bunch of data so that you can generate a stress versus strain curve so let's say your data looks like this, right? I don't know what it actually looks like on the problem. It'll be something like that. If the question then asks, what is the yield strength of this alloy? The way that you would go about doing this question, first off, you can kind of see where it starts to yield. It stops being linear kind of around there, but you can be more precise than that, right? So the way that you should go about this question is first off, realize what is the elastic modulus in this region? That's your elastic region, right? So that has a modulus right there. That's step one, determine the elastic modulus. Step two, start with this point, where that point is 0.2% strain, and then draw a line that has the same elastic modulus, right? Draw that on there and see where it intersects, and that value is your yield stress, right? Because your yield stress by definition is, okay, you've loaded it up, you've been loading your sample up to a certain, you're increasing stress, at some point it starts to introduce permanent deformation. If you paused exactly at this point and took it off, took all the load off, you'd be left with 0.2% permanent deformation. And that by definition, and we arbitrarily picked that, just the community of material scientists and mechanical engineers out there said, that we're gonna call that the yield strength. The strength at which you're left over with 0.2% deformation. So that's how I go about this question. Yeah, Arthur? So we're supposed to do a line, right, that has the, that has the same uh, uh, slope as the first one, and then we're supposed to find the intersection, but uh, on Excel, how do we find the equation of the second, of the blue line, and then we try to use Good question. If you want to be really mathematical to it, what I would suggest to do is to do a fit to this, right? So again, if you have your data points, these things are linear. Then they do that. I would try and fit this with a function. You could try fitting this first part with the linear part, the second part with the polynomial. And then you could set those two equations equal, right? But that line and this line, you could see at what x value they're equal to one another. Um, but if you just do it graphically, that's fine as well. I'm okay with that. So, right, if you could just put like a print that off or on your computer, put a ruler over it and see it intersects at a certain point. Again, it'd be more accurate to actually find two equations and set them equal to one another. But if you just do it graphically, that's okay too. 
Yeah, let me. Yeah, in our stress with the strain plots, are we plotting human hearing stress and strain or fluid stress? Great question. Because the data does not give you the instantaneous cross sectional area, you can only do the engineering stress, which is the, the force divided by the initial area. Even though that area is getting smaller, so the true stress would be different, it would be a different curve, but you're not given that instantaneous cross sectional area, so you have to use engineering. Yeah, Arthur? Per Poisson's ratio? So you'd have to know, again, if you wanted to know the Poisson's ratio at each individual point, you'd have to know the cross set, you'd have to know the dimensions at each point, and you're not given that. So you're going to have to do it off of the very end, right? Again, Poisson's ratio being defined as um, the negative strain in the direction of the load, right? Say y, divide, or let's do z. I think we normally define that as the z direction. Like, say it's pulling up and down, call that the z direction divided by the strain in either the x or the y directions, right? That, that's how you define it. So I, you'd have to do this in this case at the very end when it breaks. Okay? Yeah, in the back, Spencer? So are you finding the slope of this line? Yeah, it's the slope of this linear region. That's yeah. the yield strength? That's not the yield strength, that's the elastic modulus. Uh, then you use that elastic modulus starting at 0.2%, you draw it with the same slope, see where it intersects, and that gives you the yield strength. Uh, yeah, Rob? 0.2% uh, strain. Yeah, and so, no, 0.2 strain, right? So strain is given in delta L over L naught. Oh, yeah, okay. So you're going to define that as 0 0.00, let's see, 0? Uh, no, 0 0.002, that is equal to 0.2%. So start at that point. Draw a line with the uh, with the slope of your elastic modulus. See where it intersects. That's your yield strength. The more exact way would be to fit equations, fit lines to these uh, data, and set them equal to each other. Anything else I can answer on this? Yeah. yeah remind, remind me your name. Scott. Scott. So on number six, it, in the problem, it tells us we estimate the sample is four point ten meters. Okay. And then the Excel sheet would tell us the load is thirteen point ten. Oh, that's probably a typo. Let me double check that. And I'll make an announcement. It's probably a typo. Anything else I can answer? Okay, let's keep going then. So for today, I don't think we'll get all the way through it, but we'll start today. Our learning objectives are, we're going to introduce something called the Hall-Petch equation. This is an important material science equation. This is something that you should take out of this class for sure. What it does is it calculates yield strength as a function of grain size, right? So if you change the grain size of your material, you're going to change the yield strength, and this, this describes that relationship. We'll explain how ductility and hardness trade-offs exist especially as you do things like cold working, annealing, recovery, right? We'll introduce an expression to describe grain growth. Um, oops, that's a, that's a typo. Um, we will describe different mechanisms for the deformations of ceramics, polymers, glasses, elastomers, metals, right? So there's different mechanisms. Um, we'll define viscosity and figure out ways to, we can at least ballpark calculate it. And if we have time at the end, we'll even introduce how molecular weight, crystallinity, and that change how polymers deform. Okay, so let's start with um, plastic deformation and polycrystalline materials. So we just did single crystals. Single crystals were easy. Everything was aligned perfectly. So you could calculate, you know, these exact shear stresses where they start to slide past one another. In polycrystalline materials, it's harder, right? You still get slip. Your slip systems are still activating. But the problem is that you could have one grain oriented with your lattice in a certain direction, and then right next to it, you have something different. So if it's slipping, it can only slip in that grain, and then it hits a grain boundary and it has to change directions, right? So the dislocation motion gets interrupted. And as we mentioned last class, anytime that you make it harder for the dislocations to move, you made your material stronger and harder at the expense of ductility, right? So in general, polycrystalline materials are, they're stronger and harder, right? And they're less ductile, okay? Um, okay, so another concept we need to talk about is deformation by twinning. So you can have dislocation motion providing deformation, but you can also have the whole lattice doing a cooperative shift of atoms, right? So this isn't like just a couple of atoms moving at a time, a couple of bonds breaking, forming a couple new ones, and then that repeating. This time, a lot of atoms all have to get together and move together. Here's how it works. Let's say that you're applying like a shear stress, right? Your shear stress is this way and that way. Your undistorted lattice is the one with these white dots here, these unfilled dots. 
And after it twins, or it deforms via twinning, all of these atoms literally, they all shift together and they shift in the same direction, right? That vector by which they're shifting is the same, the same direction and magnitude. And what it creates is what is called a twinned region. So if you look at this region over here, this is not a great drawing because it, it should keep the same symmetry, right? This is like, that should be slightly rectangular here. That rectangle has now been shifted over there. So whoever made this drawing disregarded that fact a little bit. But what you'll see is that you'll see a mirror along this direction, right? So this, this uh, that plane, I guess you'd say, that's the twin plane, and you should have mirror symmetry. So again, whoever made this did not make it correctly because that point should mirror that point. We learned that a couple chapters ago when we, when we learned about mirrors, uh, about twin boundaries, right? But that's the concept behind it. By applying a shear stress, if the atoms cooperatively shift like that, then you can still achieve deformation. Just somebody just drew it badly here. Um, here it's drawn correctly, right? So here you've got these vertical rectangles, and then those get rotated by this cooperative shift of atoms, and then it shears again, and it's back to vertical above, right? So if you zoom in on this, you can see that that's kind of happening. And they preserve the mirror symmetry, right? On this side, you got this atom. On that side, you got that atom. Uh, over here, you got that atom, that one here. So this one's been drawn correctly, right? This atom mirrors to that one. So it's two mirror planes, and you can achieve deformation. Okay. Um, so which one is preferred? Is dislocation motion preferred or is twinning preferred? If they can both produce deformation, how do we know which one happens? It's actually pretty interesting. There's a really cool video that we're going to watch that shows this, right? In this demonstration, we're going to illustrate deformation twinning using these two bars of freshly cast tin. So tin has a tetragonal crystal structure, which is a much lower symmetry than most metals. Which makes, dis uh, which makes dislocation motion more difficult. Okay, that's important what you just said there. The higher the symmetry of something, the more slip systems are available. If you remember last class, we talked about FCC versus HCP. We said FCC has 12. I double-checked it. It is 12. Um, 12 slip systems, and HCP only has 3. HCP is less symmetric than cubic, right? So here she's saying that tetragonal is even lower symmetry. So it has fewer slip systems still, okay? and therefore favors deformation twinning. So I'm going to take one of these bars and I'm going to heat it up using freshly boiled water. So I'm going to leave that there for just a little while and in the meantime I'm going to take this bar that's just at room temperature and I'm going to bend it. And I'm going to do that quite close to the microphone, and you should be able to hear why in a second. Okay, what are you hearing, right? It sounds like this crunching. That's a metal. It's an unusual noise, right, for a metal to make. If you took a piece of aluminum, like a coat hanger, you don't hear that. So what is it you think that you're hearing there? Anybody have a thought? Anyone want to be brave? How about this? Turn to your neighbor. Tell them what on earth do you think you're hearing. Okay, anybody have a thought? Did your neighbor have a thought that you liked? Kyle, what do you think? So you think it might be dislocation. Okay, good guess. It's not that. What would create noise? Well, think what is noise, first off? If you put your ear up to like a, a train track, you can hear the train really, really far away, right? Way, way better than if your, your ear was just hearing in air. You're hearing vibrations and waves. And how did twinning occur? We said it's this cooperative motion of atoms, right? So again, if I were like pushing on this group of students, they would, I'd have to rely on like a big chunk of them all in unison taking a step in some sort of direction with some magnitude, right? That creates a wave, right? It's a sound wave, right? It creates a wave. So dislocation motion is much smaller number of atoms locally storing. So what you're hearing is twinning. It's the formation of twins, right? So it's deforming via twinning and you can literally hear those sound waves, right? So let's keep on listening. So now I'm going to take the one that's been heating up and do exactly the same thing to it.
Okay, somebody help me understand this. Turn to your neighbor and explain why did it cry? Why did you hear the tin cry is what they call it, the crackling noise in one case. You heat it up and you no longer hear it. What does this tell you about dislocation versus twinning in this material? Okay, any thoughts? How do we explain this? Why did it do it in one case, heat it up and it no longer does it? Anybody want to try and explain this? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. So in this scenario, first off, she started by saying it's a tetragonal crystal. Tetragonal crystals don't have many slip systems, so dislocation we know is not going to be the favored mechanism probably. Like hexagonal, tetragonal, these crystals tend to twin rather than dislocations moving. But if you heat it up and you give it energy, right, it can achieve it. So in this case we see evidence, and we haven't learned why yet, but we see evidence that at low temperatures the, the dominant mechanism of deformation is twinning, heat it up and the dominant mechanism switches to dislocation motion. And the way that we know that is by hearing it in this case. If you had a microscope and you could zoom in on it, you would see twin boundaries in one, and you'd see evidence of dislocation motion in the other, basically. Okay? All right. Yeah? Uh, you said something about um, if a crystal structure is less symmetric, then there's less, then it's less, probably, there's less. There's a, there's a smaller number of slip systems. Let's go back to this, because we there's some confusion last class on it. If we go back to our slip systems, First off, we we're trying to decide if this was 12 or 24. So there's there's two sides to, sorry, there's tw there's six sides of the dice, right? If you've got this dice, six sides. And you've got, you can slip like along those directions in each one. The way that you get 12 is by re remembering that if it slips forwards or backwards, that's just one slip system, right? So then you've got two per side of the dice, that's two times six gives you the 12. If you have a different symmetry crystal that isn't cubic, that number tends to be lower. And I'm not going to have you calculate those for anything. They get a little bit more complicated. So I'll just say for this class, I need to know is that FCC is going to be the most ductile metal because it has the highest number of slip systems. Hexagonal or body center cubic ones tend to have fewer and they tend to be less ductile. Okay? Yeah? yeah, Takara? So in the case of 10, would heating it up slightly change its crystal structure? No, it could. If it changed its crystal structure, that might explain it. I don't think that's what happens in tin, though. I don't think that there's a phase transformation just above room temperature or anything. I think it's just that given thermal energy, given those conditions, the dominant, the, the, the mechanism that is lowest energy is dislocation motion. It just costs less energy. Okay? Yeah, Arthur? So my question is, there, does twinning prefer any specific <laughs> Twinning is, yeah, so twinning is preferred in HCP, right, because it doesn't have as many slip systems. So if you have tetragonal or HCP, something with a small number of slip systems, you might, a good guess would be that twinning will probably be favorable as opposed to dislocation motion. Okay? Should keep going. Oh, yeah. Matt? Um, yeah, good question. Dislocation motion, that's kind of like this inchworm, right? So you've got this, uh, let's scroll up to the top where I've already got an image rather than trying to draw it. So you've got, here's your extra half row of atoms right there. See how it's been packed in there? If you apply a shear stress to this thing, let's say you're pushing it there and you're pushing it there, you could give it energy for it to break its bonds and for it to shift over. But look at the bonds that have to break. All you really have to do is you have to break that bond and then form a new bond there and then you create this situation where that it's shifted over by one, right? You could do it again, you break a relatively small number of bonds and you shift it over to there, and eventually that thing will pop out at the end, and that's plastic deformation. You've literally deformed the material by pushing it out on the side, right? So that's what we call dislocation motion. This is with an edge dislocation. It's a little bit harder to visualize with a screw dislocation, but it's also possible. Remember, the screw dislocation is like the uh, garage, the parking garage that spirals. Um, either of those are able to move and achieve deformation, 
and the number of bonds that you break and, and atoms you require to move are relatively small compared to twinning, which involves a much higher number of atoms moving. And as atoms moving in, se in sequence with each other, all in step with one another, that produces the acoustic wave that you can hear, that's the crackling noise that you heard. Okay? Other, other questions I can answer here? Okay, let's keep going. Okay. So that's twinning versus dislocation motion in polycrystalline materials. Um, now let's shift gears and talk about mechanisms to strengthen materials, right? Um, and you're always going to need to do this as engineers. You're going to need to be able to compromise between strength, toughness, and ductility. You can't have all of them at a maximum. There's a compromise to be had. You always have to somehow pick. We're going to have a certain ductility, a certain strength, and a certain toughness, but you can't maximize all of them. And one of the most common ways to control that compromise is by controlling grain size, right? And it's usually like this inverse relationship, right? So um, here's the key thing I want you to remember, and this is a, a key takeaway for this whole class, actually. We've said it now two or three times, but if you restrict or you hinder the motion of dislocations, then you've made the material harder and stronger, right? If that dislocation can't slide, then you can't deform the material. So it's harder and stronger, but you made it less ductile. If you make them easy to move, you make it weaker and softer, but more ductile, okay? Therefore, if you want to strengthen a material, one thing that you might do to strengthen it is just reduce the grain size, right? If you've got your material, if you're looking under the microscope and you've got really big grains, imagine that scenario, and then compare it with this one, right? With a bunch of really small grains, right? So imagine the dislocation that has to move through this material. In one case, the dislocation might look something like this, right? This dislocation, as you stress the material, it's going to move that way. And it can go quite a ways without having to change direction or anything. That same dislocation can only go there, and then it might have to change. It might have to move on that direction. It might have to change entirely. You're going to give it a whole bunch of different ways that, it, that these dislocations have to move. So anything that you do to make dislocations harder to move, you made it stronger and harder. So one thing you could do right off the bat if you want to make a material harder and stronger, reduce the grain size. Now let me ask you this. How on earth do you reduce the grain size? Maybe turn to a neighbor and talk about how would you reduce the grain size in a material? A big chunk of steel, how do you reduce the grain size? Okay, any ideas? How do you go about shrinking grains in a material? Right? How do you do that? What do you think, Rob? Cold working is absolutely the way to go. So again, if you remember the blacksmithing video, when that thing comes out of the furnace and it's piping hot, it's like red or orange, they hit it and at first, every hit that they hit it, it really dents a lot. And if they don't put that back in the furnace, for two reasons it's gonna get, uh, your deformation is gonna get less and less. For one, it's cooling off. And for two, you're filling it full of dislocations, right? Every time that you slam a hammer on that thing and you create a bunch of dislocations, now imagine a new dislocation. As it's trying to move, it sees other dislocations. And what we learned earlier in this chapter is that dislocations on average repel one another. If they're perfectly anti-aligned, if you've got one pointing up, one pointing down, then they're attracted. But on average, that's not the case, and they repel one another. So the more dislocations you put into this by pounding on it, you, the harder you make it. So one way is just by pounding on it. You literally break up these grains by, by cold working it. You see really dramatic example of that in cold rolling. So you take, um, for example, how they make aluminum foil. I might have a video of this. I can find a video. But when they take, uh, and make, when they make aluminum foil, how they start is with a giant ingot of aluminum, right? And then they pass it through rollers that are a set distance apart. They run it through, and then they bring it a little bit closer, and they run it through again, bring it a little bit closer. So this is cold rolling, you're slowly deforming it. And then if they heat it up, doing hot rolling, all you're doing is you're giving it thermal energy to uh, get rid of those dislocations. Because every time you pass it through, you create dislocations. The more dislocations, the harder it is for them to move, the harder it would be. Eventually it would become brittle, it would, it would break. So they heat it up during this process as they pass it through, and it just gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. But what you're doing is you're dramatically changing 
what's called the microstructure, which is the grains. Their shape, their orientation, you dramatically change it. So let me show you an image of that real quick. Yeah, as you cold roll it, here's a, a cartoony example, right? But it could go from what we call equiaxed grains on the left, where the grains are kind of randomly oriented. And as you pass it between those cold rollers over and over, your final product is going to have really elongated and smaller grains, right? We're going to come back to that in a second. Okay, so Hall Petch basically is the equation that says your hardness or your yield strength is going to be inversely proportional to your grain size. The smaller your grain size, and they've got a weird axis here, this is small grains on the right, big grains on the left, right? So the smaller your grains, the higher your hardness. The smaller your grains, the higher your yield strength, okay? So the Hall Petch equation can be written as follows Your yield strength is equal to sigma naught, a constant, plus k, a constant times d, your grain size, to the negative one-half power. So for any given material, for a steel or for whatever else, an iron and a titanium, if you figure out sigma naught and k, constants for those materials, then you know how the yield strength is going to change if you were to change your grain size. And that could be going up in grain size or going down. How would you go up in grain size? Any ideas? How would you increase grain size? It's clear that you can decrease it. You can roll it or you can pound on it, right? Brandon, what do you do? <laughs> Annealing is a heat treatment. You're right. If you heat something up, you generally make it bigger, right? You go from small grains like this picture here, you'd go from that to that by heating it. Annealing it or heat treating it causes the grains to grow. What's the reason for this? Turn to your neighbor and tell me what's a possible reason why grains might want to grow if you were to give it time and temperature. Okay, if you start out with a material that has small grain size and you want to make it large, you're going to heat it up. What's the driving force of that? Let me pick on you in the black hat. Remember your name? Jaren. Jaren, what do you think is going on? No idea. No idea. The surface energy within the grain boundaries. That's exactly it. The surface energy, right? Surfaces cost energy. And here you've got oodles of surfaces, right? So that's costing you a ton of energy. So if you could anneal it and give it time and energy for atoms to reorganize themselves, they're actually going to get rid of that. That's exactly the reason why, right? It has to do with surface energy. The mechanism, we won't, I don't think we get to in this class. I think we just briefly talked about it. But that's the driving force. It's just getting rid of surface energy, okay? So that's the hall Petch equation. So if I gave you an expression that, t that told you how grains grow, which we'll get to in a minute, and I gave you a starting grain size, you could figure out, okay, it grows a certain amount, and that changed my yield strength by a certain amount. You can couple these things together. Yeah, question? You said D was the grain size. D is the grain size. That's correct. Okay. Other questions I can answer about this Hall Petch equation? It's one of these famous material science equations you use a lot. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, we've already talked about why um, impurities strengthen an alloy. So I'll just one more time, I'll say it that again, if you have your atoms and you have this extra half row, right? So in the vicinity of this thing, we could draw compressive and tensile regions. We'd say that this is under compression, and we'd say that on the other side, this is under tension, right? So if you have an impurity atom that is too small, your impurity is a little bit smaller, it's going to choose to sit right there, right? Because that region was under compression. And if you have an impurity atom that's too large, it might choose to occupy right there, because that region is already under tension, so a bigger atom is welcome there. So in either case, if your impurity is there, your dislocation doesn't want to leave the impurity. If you make the dislocation harder to move, you made a harder, stronger material at the expense of ductility. And this is why sterling silver is a harder, uh, harder metal than just regular pure silver. Okay. And again, we call that pinning. So that's a term that you'll hear people use. Pinning dislocation means making them harder to move. Doing something like a grain boundary, an impurity, other dislocations, they all pin dislocation motion. Okay, um, you can cold work something. We've been talking about this. Cold working, the percent cold working is just your initial cross-sectional area minus your deformed cross-sectional area divided by your initial. That's just strain, right? That's strain. So it's strain over strain plus one is actually technically what it would be, right? So that's cold working. I'm going to skip that step. Cold working makes it harder and stronger but at the expense of ductility. 
Okay, let's get to the next concept, which is recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. So let's say that you're your blacksmith and you take the sword out of the hammer, out of the fire, you start pounding on it, you, you undergo this process of recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. When you take it out, you start pounding on it, you're deforming the grains, you're making them smaller, and you're filling them with deformations, dislocations, you know, uh, stretched bonds, what have you. If you heat that up and you don't grow the grains, but you heat it up, that's called recovery. Recovery is the process of heating it up just enough that the dislocations become mobile. They can flip each other around and come back and, and annihil or whatever, annihilate, right? That's recovery. Recrystallization is when the, the lattice is so messed up that it's cheaper in terms of energy to grow a new grain rather than trying to fix the broken grain, right? If you're like flipping a house, at some point it's cheaper to tear the house down and start over. That's recrystallization. If the house, if it's cheaper to, to patch it up and just make it look nice, that's recrystallization. In terms of grains, this is what it looks like. Okay, you start out with this undeformed structure. This is the percent cold work is increasing. So now it's really uh, been oriented in one direction. The grain size has changed. It's also filled with a bunch of problems, right? So as you heat it up, if you have a bunch of problems in there, you're going to begin by getting rid of the dislocations, right? Eventually, if it's so messed up, you're actually going to grow new grains, right? See how these new grains are crystallizing these dark ones? They grow, they become larger, and eventually you end up with this equiax structure that's kind of similar to what you started with, right? So we went from an equiax, meaning kind of round, in every direction it's the same, to really anisotropic, right? These grains are laying on one another like that. And you can change that just through this heat treating process, right? So recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth are all, all tied to this annealing process after cold working. Can I answer any questions about that? Yeah. How would you annual it after cold work? Great question. One reason, well, what, if you were, if you want a sword that is both really, really sharp, well, first of all, how do you get a sharp sword? Turn to a neighbor. How do you make a material sharp? If you want to sharpen it, do you want a hard or a soft material? All right, everyone knows this. All right, this is why ceramic knives. You buy a ceramic knife because ceramics are crazy hard, and therefore they can polish it to have a crazy sharp edge on it, right? If you buy like a knife sharpening kit, it'll have like the Japanese five degree or like us heathen barbarian 10 degree ones. The five degrees a much lower angle, so it's much sharper, right? You have to have a hard material for that. So you want the, the hardness for that, but if it's really hard, a ceramic knife, when you drop it on your kitchen floor, it can break, and that's not great. So you'd like to have hardness and toughness. So what you might do is you might cold work it like crazy so it's hard, put a good edge on it, and then you do what's, you've probably seen the picture of this, when they quench it, they'll heat it up, and then they'll quench it, what they're doing there is they're adding back some ductility. They're taking away some hardness, right? But they're giving it some toughness and they're giving it some ductility so that the sword won't break when you try and chop something with it. Fair enough? All right. So that's recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. Again, grain growth, it's driven by this uh, energy reduction of surface energy reduction, which uh, Jaron figured out for us. And the process by which it happens is called Ostwald ripening. So named after the guy who came up with it, he basically said that the big get bigger and the small get smaller. It's a sad story about life, grain growth here, right? You can see it. So this is a computer simulation, but it's pretty close to what actually happens, right? You start out with small grains. They're going to grow at the expense of the small grains, right? So the little ones are like little banks. They're getting eaten by the big banks, right? These things just grow. We'd say that this material is undergoing Ostwald ripening or grain growth, right? Again, this is a computer simulation. In real cases, it looked pretty similar to this. We're not going to dive into the mechanism of this. I'll just say that it has to do with differences in solubility. Basically, a grain dissolves from small ones and then precipitates in the big ones. So we won't get into the mechanism. That's kind of the idea behind it, though. But things will grow. So if you heat it up, given time and temperature, it will get rid of surfaces by Oswald ripening. Okay? And the way that it happens is by this equation. where d um, n, that's the grain size, is raised to an exponent, which is a constant for some material, minus d naught, that's your initial size raised to an exponent, equals k t. So just like before, d naught and k are constants for your material. You would have to figure them out ahead of time. But once you know them, you can figure out how much something is going to grow. Okay? We're out of time, so we'll pick up here next time.